So good morning and welcome to our first Spotlight series. These go, hi, these go through the end of the day. So welcome to the very first one. Um, I'd like to introduce Francesca Molinaro. She is the principal for a company called Decode Leadership, and she's going to be talking about LGBT inclusion in Latin America and the Caribbeans. And so let's welcome her, and we've got 20 minutes. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? My microphone is on. Great. Well, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm Francesca. I'm the founder of Decode Leadership, and we're a boutique consulting company in Washington, D.C., and we specialize in strategic diversity and inclusion, leadership development, and coaching. In my previous life, I was the diversity leader at the Inter-American Development Bank. Our footprint was Latin America and the Caribbean. We were headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we operated in 26 countries in the region. And one of my mandates was to help drive inclusion for our LGBT employees. So I became intimately familiar with the region, and today I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned. Um, so I'm going to just fast forward to um, our agenda here. And what I'd really like to share with you is what this landscape looks like. Um, the region is very unique because um, the, the rights that we see and the challenges that we see vary greatly um, across countries. It's also a region that has developed very quickly. Really, the, the legislative uh, framework for LGBT inclusion has exploded in the last few years, and I'm going to share that with you. I'd also like to talk a little bit about what we need to think about when we're creating LGBT inclusive workplaces when we're operating in the region. Um, we don't have a lot of time today, and I want to make sure you're getting out of this which you need. So just a show of hands, how many of you are operating in either Latin America or the Caribbean right now in your companies? Okay, so a couple of you. Um, are there any topics or countries that you're most interested in hearing about? Brazil. Okay, I'll be talking about Brazil. Okay, so let's get started. And I'm going to leave um, probably about five, seven minutes at the end for Q&A as well so we can dialogue on this. So what you have here is a timeline of LGBT rights in Latin America. Uh, I didn't put everything on there. I put some of the important firsts. Uh, but I think you'll note two different things here. Um, one is that we're talking about very current history. These are things that are happening now. And as I mentioned, um, Latin America was not the first region to adopt LGBT inclus inclusive legislation and enshrine rights and protections for LGBT people, but it has done so more rapidly than any other region um, in the world. The other thing that you're going to notice is that I keep talking about Latin America and the Caribbean, but you're going to see the Caribbean is noticeably absent um, from this timeline. Um, and that's because there haven't been many advances in that region. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more when we move on to the challenges. Um, I think what's important to, to point out here is that um, Argentina was the first country in the region to legalize same-sex marriage. Since then, um, we've had Brazil, Uruguay, and um, just last year, Colombia also um, legalized same-sex marriage. And we also have civil union in um, Ecuador and Chile. Mexico is um, an anomaly. Mexico was actually the first country, um, the first city in Latin America was Mexico City to legalize same-sex marriage. I say Mexico is an anomaly because um, Marriage is not a federal um, domain, it's at the state level, so it's, it's a little bit of a checkerboard. In most states in Mexico, you can get married, but it is recognized nationally. So if you happen to live in a state where it's not legal to get married and you get married in the, the capital or neighboring state, that is, um, is recognized. Um, when we look at these, um, these rights, you'll see that uh, legislation has been enacted covering different types of protections, um, property rights, adoption. You can adopt in four countries in the region. Um, and 
one of the things I really want to point out here is Argentina. Argentina is not only a leader in the region, it's really a global leader when it comes to transgender rights. So it was the first country, um, and that was in 2012, to put in place a gender identity law, which means that individuals who um, identify as transgendered can legally change the gender on their identity cards without going through um, a huge process, medical exams, so on and so forth. There's a few countries that have followed. Um, and now they've also put in a really interesting law. Um, it's the transgender quota law for the province of Buenos Aires. And what that states is that 1% of, um, of provincial, so um, say public employees, um, must be transgendered. They've been having some difficulties implementing the law and enforcing it. However, I'm keeping my eyes open because this is very progressive and what this could mean is much more opportunity for the transgender community to get access to training and to employment. So again, very, very progressive set of laws. The only country from the English-speaking Caribbean that's on my chart is Belize. And um, what Belize did last year was they moved forward with decriminalizing um, uh, same-sex um, sexual activity. Um, and it's, it's one of the few countries that have moved forward. And that's one of the challenges that, that we're going to um, talk about. So that's the first one, anti-LGBT laws. We still have 10 countries in the English-speaking Caribbean that have laws carried over from um, colonial times. So from the, most of these are in the British West Indies, um, uh, where they have um, anti-gay laws on the books, criminalizing homosexual activity, if you can believe it or not. One of the interesting things about the Caribbean is that it really doesn't follow the global trends. When we look globally, um, we see when countries are, have um, their stable democracies, long established, stable political systems, and high levels of uh, economic development, they usually become more liberalized, and the Caribbean is not following suit. Another challenge we have in the region is violence. So we've all heard of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, and I really like to say this is a tale of two regions. We have some of the most progressive protections and rights enshrined in constitutions, in legal frameworks, and yet the region is still one of the most violent for LGBT people, not only in the Caribbean. Um, Brazil, this is where I think it's really interesting to look at Brazil. Again, very progressive. Brazil has the largest pride celebration in the world in Sao Paulo, but it is also considered one of the deadliest places for LGBT people on Earth. About 40% of the violence reported against LGBT people comes from Brazil, and it's estimated that almost one person a day is killed in Brazil for being LGBT. It's staggering. The violence in, in Brazil is staggering, and that's repeated across um, the country. So safety is still a concern in the region, despite the rights. And uh, transgendered population is particularly at risk. Um, and, and one of the challenges is that we find that while laws have advanced, attitudes have not always followed suit. What I think is interesting when you look at the evolution of LGBT rights, if you look at Europe, if you look at the US, typically attitudes have changed and laws have followed suit. In Latin America, we've had this explosion where laws have changed very rapidly, but attitudes, opinions, have not always followed suit. Part of the reason is the evolution of the movement. It's really under the umbrella of this human rights movement versus um, just uh, a gay rights movement. So um, part of how it's evolved means that opinions haven't always kept up. Where do we see that um, particular issues? Um, homophobia in the Caribbean is, is very strong still. You see it a lot in popular culture, in the music, in reggae music. There's a lot of lyrics, if you listen to it, that um, are anti-gay. Um, there's still a lot of social stigma, depending on where you live. Uh, still rural-urban divides in the region. 
and I would say conservatism. Um, the region is a very religious re region, and we've seen over the last 50 years or so um, a rise of evangelicalism in the region. So in those areas where that's very strong, like in Central America, we see that rights are not as advanced as we see in other places of the region. So in a nutshell, those are some of the, the key challenges we face when we're working in the region. So for any of you who have, uh, and what I want to do now is really shift to thinking about this in terms of the workplace perspective. Um, before I do that, just um, to note that I have um, a map here, and I have some resources. I can hand those out to anyone who's interested, just some select resources. And all that to say, it just summarizes what I've pointed out, that LGBT acceptance in the region is a spectrum. And this comes from America's Quarterly that, that looks at this and, and creates a social inclusion index. But what I really want to do is take it to the workplace now. Um, for people like me, who were work, was working in the region, how do we ensure that we can create workplaces that are friendly and safe for our LGBT employees that are situated globally? And these are some of the lessons that I've learned or some of the important considerations. And um, I'll share with you a few anecdotes as well. So the first thing is to become educated. Rights are changing almost daily. I would expect that the next country to legalize gay marriage would be Chile um, in the region. Mexico may also follow suit. Why is that important? Rights are changing. So how do we recognize um, spouses, our benefits policies? There's a lot of implications for global mobility, et cetera, et cetera, when we're, we're lo looking at the region. So one of the important things is to become educated and to understand what that landscape looks like. The ILGA is a really great website um, and a resource where um, they publish um, uh, the status of laws and criminalization across the globe. So that's a good resource to look at. It's also really important to partner with uh, local NGOs, institutions who know and understand this topic so that we're clear about the terminology. Um, what are some of the, the key pain points or entry points for the region? Educate others. I think this is really important to support training and awareness um, and to really uh, focuses on creating a respectful workplace. I know that we can't change the laws in the countries we operate, but we have corporate values, and this kind of goes with my next point. So it's really important that as a corporate citizen, at least for me when I was at the IDB and leading diversity and inclusion, that we modeled our values across the region, irrespective of uh, the legal framework that was in place. So what does that mean? It means that we talked about cultural competence. We have inclusion as a, a corporate value. What happened in our four walls? I didn't go there and trying to change hearts and minds. You can believe what you want to believe. But how that manifests in the workplace in terms of how we talk to colleagues, how we treat colleagues. Um, we had anti-harassment policy. So it was really important that we made it clear when you walk through these doors, you're part of the IDB community, and there is an expectation in terms of conduct and behavior because we want to make sure that everyone feels safe and included. Um, it's also really important to create dialogue. In some of these countries, we're just not having these discussions. People have misconceptions and, and, um, and frankly, stereotypes. A good um, example of that, I did a, a workshop for our country office in Belize. At the time, I, I just... Uh, noted that Belize changed its law in 2016. At the time, this hadn't passed. And um, there is a culture of homophobia that is accepted. We did have gay employees in our office, and they had to deal with that on a daily basis in the guise of religion, um, th that it's wrong, it's immoral, so on and so forth. So we had a, a general workshop on our values, respect in the workplace, cultural competence. And one of the questions that came up was, um, well, I would feel uncomfortable if a lesbian employee hit on me, a female asked the question. I said, I agree with you. 
I would feel uncomfortable and it's not appropriate. But that behavior is not appropriate from anyone. You would not expect sexual advances in the workplace. And we have a sexual harassment policy that covers that. So this is not about sexual orientation. This is about proper conduct in the workplace. Few other things, support LGBTQ ERGs and allies. We worked really hard to make sure that if there wasn't a local network, that our employees knew that there was a lifeline to headquarters and that they could reach out to someone. Our ERG Globe, when they traveled for work to any of our country offices, would ask to have a presentation. And we would find that we did have employees in almost every single country who would then come up to them afterwards and say, thank you, this is my situation and I need support. Employees need to know that they feel supported and there's a, a safe place. And that goes to my last point around making safe a priority. Um, for any of you working in human resources or, or collaborating with human resources, we need to be aware of what's going on in the region if we're sending workers over there. So in terms of what does that mean for visas, um, for safety, and, and I would just say in general, I didn't touch on this, it's really important as well for other policies to know the, the legal landscape like benefits, uh, pensions, etc. Um, some of the things that we did was important to not take a one-size-fits-all approach. We have had domestic partner benefits for many, many, many years. But in some countries where it's illegal to be in a gay relationship, you cannot get something notarized. You do not have documentation to prove that. So we would have to take things on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that we were extending the same uh, quality of benefits to all our employees and weren't creating a differentiated uh, playing field. We don't have too much more time. Here's my information. You can reach out to me if you'd like. Um, I have a lot more information. This was a very short presentation, but I'd like to know if there are any questions. I could take one or two questions quickly. Uh, is there a way that you handle self-ID in terms of how you know, uh, especially with the quotas, for example, are mm -hmm. employees asked to uh, self-identify? Um, I think that that would depend on um, if you collect that information. Um, by the jurisdiction that you're working in. We did not require employees to, to self-identify. Um, in Argentina, we were not covered by that quota law, um, but I think you know, other companies may handle that differently in terms of self-identification. What we did do, though, was that we had a voluntary diversity and inclusion survey because I wanted a baseline of who our population is. 4% of our employees self-identified as being LGB or, or T, which is um, in line with what we, global norms. Um, and it was really important because it allowed us to then uh, target our activities. When you talked about uh, make safety a priority. Yes. And, and you also talked about part of that, make uh, staying connected. Yes. How would you respond or answer an organization where they have stood up a women's ERG of veterans and a, and a millennial, and now for the LGBT one, they want to have a um, uh, a mechanism for those who are participating in that group to stay connected and to talk to each other and to raise concerns or fear of being retaliated or whatever. And that organization's question was, why do we need this for LGBT where we don't have it for women, millennials, and veterans, and so on and so on. So if I'm understanding your, your question, you have other established ERGs, but you don't have mechanisms to stay connected with them? That's correct. Uh, well, I, you know, one of um, my feelings is that an ERG, it's important for the ERG to know who its constituents are so that you have a voice. If you're not being able to be connected with them, you don't have much point for advocacy. How are you going to initiate change? But safety is a concern. So in, in uh, the case of our globe, what they did was create a private Facebook page where they invited people. It was closed and it was outside of the domain of the organization because there were still people who were afraid to come forward depending on the country they lived in. So they created another mechanism that their members felt safe. And the other thing is they never named their members. Nowhere did they ever publish a list of their members, but they know how to reach them. And me as the diversity advisor, I was able to also reach them through GLOBE. 
No, I don't. I think we're at time. I can stick around. I also have a list of, of some of the resources where I drew some of this information or important sites. If you'd like to take one, and my card is there. Thank you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure.